Okay, gang. So we're going to start with um, some mini lessons. And the very first lesson, which I'm actually going to try to let you know about before the very first class, is about data. Um, this is a class on statistics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a lot of mini lectures that occur actually outside of the classroom. And I want you to watch them before you come to class. There will be little tests of whether you've done that in class um, so that we can spend in class time actually working with SAS Jump and learning the ropes of actually doing statistics because <clears throat> what we're doing here in this class is building your statistical toolbox. And, um, and I think by having mini lessons outside of class that are nice, relatively short lectures on very defined topics, um, you'll find them pretty painless to watch, and it'll save class time for what's more important, which is us kind of coaching you through the process of asking questions and using SAS Jump to ask questions using data, which brings us to our very first topic. So before we actually start analyzing some data, which we're going to do on day one in our class, what we need to do is understand what data actually are. And you notice I used are, not is, because data is plural for many datums. <laughs> so usually we don't just take one piece of data, um, one datum, we would have lots of data. And so uh, we will learn in this class how to work with data. But what exactly is data? So data is a collection of observations And it's a little more than that. Um, it's observations that we use to answer questions, scientific questions, or to test hypotheses. And there's a really little distinction between those two. We'll talk about it a little bit more as the class goes on, but um, basically then uh, it's a collection of observations that constitutes what data is. Now I've used another vocabulary term here, observation. So what is an observation? An observation is going to be kind of a line of data in our data set, um, but it is the set of measurements Um, made on the smallest sampling unit. You can kind of see how this is going here. We're going to be building up our vocabulary as we go along. I'm using a new piece of vocabulary here, the sampling unit. And so you can see kind of a hierarchy here of definitions. The sampling unit is what you are measuring, what you are making measurements on, what you, as the scientist, are making measurements on. By the way, I will get better with my writing as we do this. Um, my writing is not very neat anyway, even on the board, but <laughs> I'm still learning how to use this little stylus and input device. Okay, so sampling unit, what are you, what you are making measurements on? Um, what do I mean by that? For example, it might be an individual, it might be a person that you're actually making some measurements on. Um, I don't know, if you're working with a bacterium, you might be measuring something about a, a particular cell. Um, even on a human, you might take a cell that you'd be making measurements on. Um, you might be making measurements on, uh, you know, a particular stream or even a watershed. Sorry. There we go. Come on, pen. Okay, so you might be making measurements on a number of different sampling units, but every line of our data set is going to be all the measurements we make on that one sampling unit. 
Okay, and the sampling, the way we do sampling, so here's another vocabulary term. Um, the way we do sampling, you kind of get the sense that we're not measuring everything, right? We're measuring some subset, and that's what sampling is, measuring some subset. And how we do our sampling, how we sample, defines what I call the statistical universe. Statistical universe. This sounds very grand, the statistical universe. So, the statistical universe. We need to define yet another term, statistical universe. This is the group about which we want to make inferences. About which wish to make inferences. Hmm. What do I mean by that? And what do I mean by inferences? Really, it's it's what we want to get answers to questions about or what what group we want to test hypotheses on. Okay, so the statistical universe is nothing more than the sphere of interest of our study. And that's a very important concept because as soon as we um, take a sample, we have made a lot of decisions which actually define our statistical universe. For example, if I want to make generalizations about dandelions, I won't just go out here to Woodburn Hall and select five dandelions and bring them into the lab and study them to death and claim I'm learning about all dandelions, usually that is a pretty invalid claim because those five, while they might be typical dandelions, are not representative of all dandelions. Probably a kind of a bad example biologically because those of you who are botanists may know that um, dandelions are actually clones of one another generally. Um, every seed is a clone of the parent and a clone of each other, so they're like um, identical. Um, so that wasn't the greatest of example. But even there, we're defining the population that's in the environment below Woodburn, not every population in every environment, right? So um, even if they're genetically identical, it doesn't mean we can make inferences about all the dandelions. Um, okay, so that's our the concept of statistical universe, and I wanted to um, give you that notion um, to start with as we talk about variables. Now, as we uh, kind of describe data, what I want to do is, is kind of um, illustrate it by looking at a data set. We're going to be working a lot with data sets in this course, and I want to start right off by um, talking about data sets in the same way that we're, we're actually going to use them um, and analyze them in SAS Jump. So, for example, um, we might have in the first column, and this will be very typical, we'll have the observation, or we might call it the individual, upon which we're make, measuring variables. Okay, so um, we might, you know, label them Mike and Steve and Harry and Beth and Linda, etc. They might have names like that, or they might have names like one, two, three, four rather boring, but um, anyway, they will have some kind of a name um, that labels them, and it will be unique to each row of our data set. So our rows are going to go across this way. Our first column it doesn't have to be. We could have our, our individual label, you know, in column 48 and jump. It doesn't care um, where we put it, but typically we'll want to see it on the left side so that we can quickly um, scan through, and if we're looking for individual six, we can find it um, very easily there. Okay, but then we have associated with those individuals, we have variables. And if we were talking about humans, for example, uh, variable one, um, variable number one, 
might be the sex of the individual. Okay, so we might have male, male, female, 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 male, and it, you know, the order of things doesn't matter to jump. You're just listing what is associated with each individual, and number eight is a male, number seven is female, number six is male, etc. Okay, so these are hooked together, these ID numbers and the variable value that we put in for that, but this is a variable here. Um, we can have all kinds of variables like this. For example, we might have um, variable two, which could be, um, I don't know, blood group, you know, something that we could be asking a question about the relationship between blood groups and sex, for example. And so we would have blood group associated that we have measured, something that we've actually observed um, on every individual in our population. And we might have a question that we're asking about the relationship between those. So in other words, individual one is not only male, but it's type A, etc. Okay, as we go down our list. All right, and then, you know, we could have another variable here, variable three. I apologize for the messiness. I hope you get neater as we go along. <laughs> um, variable three could be like, um, I don't know, it could be the rank uh, on a test. I don't know, let's say the rank uh, in a race. Let's say we raced these 10 individuals against one another and we ranked them and we had, you know, a unique rank for every individual um, here. And I just want to be careful not to repeat here. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm missing seven. All right, so these would be our ranks uh, in this race that we ran of these 10 individuals. So that's another kind of variable we might have. And then we might have variable four here, where we've measured something quantitative about them. For example, uh, oxygen concentration in the blood. Maybe after the race, we measured oxygen concentration. And I don't know, I should know what typical oxygen concentrations are. But let's say, you know, we had 0.04, we had 0.04, let's get a little bit of uh, precision here. 0 0.038, 0 0.069, 0 0.0, you know, and etc. I won't write them all down. Um, so this would be another kind of variable. So this is the way a data set looks, and we have a certain structure to the data set. In fact, we might not end with 10. We might have a much larger n than this. We typically would have a larger n if we wanted to make inferences, if we wanted to ask a question and get a powerful answer to it, a statistical answer um, that was not random. Um, so we would we would tend to have a larger n than this. We would have uh, a data set consisting of many more individuals than this. And for every one of those individuals, we would have variables that we've measured, one, two, three, four. Um, okay, so there are n observations in our variable. So what is what is one observation? One observation is the entire line of data, okay? So if you look back at our definition of what an observation is, it is the set of data that we've taken on a particular individual in the population. So we know that individual one is male, that it's type A blood group, that it's ranked three in this race, and that it has an oxygen concentration of 0.041, all right? So kind of an arbitrary data set, but that's an observation that we've made. And we've made n observations in our entire data set. Okay, so this is what a data set looks like and understanding the structure is important. Now, first thing you can observe from this is that there are many different kinds of data um, that we have. Uh, one, one kind of data, uh, it has letters, right? So the first two, variable one and two, are letter data. We have M versus F, we have A, O, B, of course other blood types that we could list if we wanted to get A positive, etc. Um, so we, but these, these two kinds, um, we could give a name to. We don't have a number, it's not quantitative, it's just something that has a name. 
And so those are called nominal variables. We can give a name to them. They are not continuous. They are discrete categories. That's another way of thinking about it. Okay, and you can have more than two, more than three, more than four categories, but um, a nominal variable will always be possible to give a name, and it's not something that's continuous or has a, some quantitative value. Um, now, this third kind of variable, uh, variable three here, is a ranked variable. Um, this is also called ordinal, so these are equivalent terms, ordinal variables. And honestly, um, we are not going to working with those very much. Um, but when you're in psychology and you're, there are certain kinds of variables that don't behave very well, you might change them into ranks and then you could do certain other statistics that, uh, where the assumptions are not violated. Um, so that tends to be when we use rank variables is, is in biology, we don't use them that much. In psychology and things like that, they use them quite a bit. Um, Okay, and the final kind of variable that we have here is a continuous variable. So our blood oxygen content is a continuous variable. So it can takes on um, any value between some maximum and minimum. Okay, so we could actually plot it, for example. We could put the y, put the variable here and look at the number of observations, and we would see that it kind of comes out to a normal distribution. Uh, we have a pile of observations in the middle with values that are um, hot, that are in, near the mean for this group, and then we have some high, some low, etc. Okay, <clears throat> so this is going to become important later on, and we're going to uh, talk a lot about continuous variables, but we're actually going to talk a lot about nominal variables too and all possible relationships between those two. So we're going to focus on these two. So I wanted you to understand what they are before actually the first class so that you can see. Um, I'm actually in the first class going to describe all the kinds of analyses you're going to learn in this course for the rest of the semester. And so it'd be really fun for you to be able to see at the beginning how these different kinds of variables can be analyzed to answer questions about the relationships among those variables. Um, and now that you've seen a data set, you'll understand what kinds of relationships we can examine. Um, you don't know the statistics yet uh, necessarily that can do this, although some of you might have hints about it. You might have had, uh, I know some of you have had stat 2 I believe it was. Uh, anyway, um, I know some of you have had some background in statistics. Um, some of you may have had chi-square and things like that. And, and um, those are all tests that look at relationships between variables um, using uh, this kind of a data set structure. So we'll get into that. Um, so I guess that'll be it for today for this short lesson. So look at this uh, before class. And I will see you in the first class. There'll be many more of these videos. And I'm right and we'll get